I have dedicated my professional career to the study and control of arthropods. Hello, um, I'm going to keep this light today and just talk about some of my seashells. I want to do a video series and just show some of the things I have. I collect things um, obsessively sometimes. Everything from Star Trek action figures to uh, natural history items, as you see behind me. Um, lots and lots of things. Um, so, but I'm going to talk about my seashells today. I have a, I, I collect, it's not scientific collection, it's aesthetic. Um, I, I'm just, I, I like how they look. Um, so I, I've done this for my whole life. When I was a little boy, uh, six years old, my grandparents gave me a copy of Tucker Abbott's Seashells of North America. Uh, I still have the actual copy they have with the inscription. It's kind of cool. Um, I was six, um, and then later on as an adult, I got to meet Tucker Abbott himself. Um, I got to you know hang out with him when I was working at a museum, which was really awesome. So I'm just going to jump into this here and talk about some of my shells. Again, they won't show up too well, but oh, it's the best I can do. I'm going to start with this one right here. This is uh, called the Venus's Comb Murex. It's called Venus's Comb for obvious reasons. You see these really, really long spines. Let's see if I can get that closer. Um, but it's, again, it's going to be out of focus, best I can do. Um, but the reason I want to show this one is that I have this here, which is really, really cool. I uh, actually collected this one myself. This is uh, Murex trochili. Um, Troschel's Murex, which is similar to the Venus Comb, not as many spines, but um, we got these in Thailand. We'd go to the beach where the fishermen would have, uh, they would pull in their nets and then they would have barbecues on the beach and they would actually eat these. And so we found them in the trash piles. It was kind of gross, you know, put on the gloves and dig through the trash. But you find these really beautiful shells in there and then just a bleach job and they turned out really well, really cool. So I collected a number of these. Okay, I'm gonna uh, jump into one of the one of the groups I collect semi-scientifically. I think because they're interesting are the conchs. Um, they're well, they're delicious and interesting. Um, this one here though is uh, this is called Lister's conch. Lister, like in red dwarf. If those of you familiar with the sci-fi British sci-fi show, um, but this is Lister's conch. And there's no connection in the name. I don't know who it's named after exactly. Um, but this is a uh, this is really cool. I like the stories behind some of these shells. Um, this one used to be considered extremely rare. Um, they, the very few specimens known and they sold for several hundred dollars a piece um, until I believe it was in the 70s um, a person, a man found them on uh, one of the islands in Thailand. Uh, they were for sale at a fish market, baskets full of them for sale and it turns out they were abundant in this one region so now you can pick them up for a couple of dollars. Um, I, buy, I buy most of my shells. Um, uh, keep re relative of the conchs here. Um, this is a uh, carrier shell. Um, it's kind of hard to see. Again, I'll hold it close and hopefully it'll show up somewhat. Um, but this shell is really cool because they take and they adhere other seashells to their, as they grow, they adhere them to the, as the, the growth portion of their lip. Um, and some of them pick seashells. Some species only use coral. Some species only use rocks. Um, they're all different, and they're all you know they all have their different patterns. This one randomly just chooses seashells, um, but others are really specific in the type. Like they only will pick scallops, so they'll adhere scallop shells to themselves as they grow. Um, these those kinds of things. And now apparently, and it's rumored, I haven't seen the proof, but um, it's rumored that some species use uh, bottle caps, beer bottle caps that they find, and that they only are using beer bottle caps to adhere to their shell, which is, I don't know if it's true, but if it is, it's, it's kind of interesting. Uh, here's another uh, conch relative. Uh, this is a, uh, uh, just called tibia fusis, or the spindle tibia. Um, you can see it's got a really, really long siphonal canal on it. Um, these things are actually remain bur burrowed in the mud, and then just the siphonal canal sticks up to breathe, just like kind of like clams do. Um, but it's it's covered in shell, which is pretty cool. Um, other tibia, this is a relative, this is tibia martini, um, which just has a short siphonal canal. Um, but again, close relative. Uh, let's see what I have here. I guess next I'll talk about, yeah, this here is, again, I apologize for the quality. Uh, this is a uh, precious wentel trap. It's called a staircase sna snail sometimes. Uh, Wentel traps are really cool looking. Um, they all have the same. They're all. They all look very similar. And most of them look very similar. But with these uh, Wentel traps, this one right here is called the precious Wentel trap because they used to be um, 
back in the uh, 19th century when people collected shells sort of as a gentleman's hobby. Um, these sold for up to, uh, I believe, US, with modern money, about $10,000. Um, they were thought to be very, very rare. Um, so rare that Chinese made uh, forgeries using rice paper. They actually would make duplicate these with using rice paper paste or rice paste. Um, and they were so indistinguishable from the real ones um, until they got wet and then they would dissolve. Which um, And now, apparently, um, there are rewards offered because there's no existing rice paper copies left. Um, there are rewards for anybody who can actually come up with an original rice paper copy of them, which would they, I believe the going rate would be about $10,000 if somebody had an authentic one. Um, but they've all subsequently dissolved, which I think is kind of interesting. Okay, I'm going to talk here about the uh, cowries. Uh, this is a real popular group. A lot of people collect cowries. Um, this here is a tiger cowrie. Uh, these are probably sold in every shell shop in the world. Um, they're, uh, this is the largest of the cowries, and, um, and also they're very common. Um, but some of them are not so common. Here is a golden cowrie. Uh, you can see that here. It's got this really rich gold color on the outside. Um, solid, really cool. Uh, here is a, it's called the spotted cowrie. This is Cypria guttata. These are also uh, quite rare and hard to obtain. Um, and uh, here's a deer cowrie from Florida. Um, these are fairly common. Uh, tortoise cowrie, again, another common one. Um, now the cone shells, I'll, I'll probably end it, well, I'll, one more thing after these. Cone shells are, um, these are interesting because they actually use poison darts to uh, kill their prey. And so species that feed on worms and other invertebrates um, have a poison that's equivalent, people say it's equivalent to a bee sting. Um, but the larger ones that hunt fish have a neurotoxin that's uh, chemically similar, it's called conotoxin, to the um, cobra venom. And it's actually deadlier than a cobra venom, um, uh, gram for gram. Um, and they can actually kill people. There's been several fatalities recorded from people picking up cone shells and uh, having them get stung. Um, they use it defensively, um, and so. Um, but a lot of cone shells are collect. They're, they're popular collectors' items, and they're they're very rare. This here is the uh, called the Glory of Bengal Conus Bengalensis. Um, these are these are these are pretty pretty hard to obtain. Uh, this is called the Glory of India. This is Conus milned ward's eye. Um, again, another rare species. And then, to keep with the glory, my glory trifecta. Uh, here is the Glory of the Sea. Um, this is, uh, if you do a Google search on Glory of the Sea, it's got a really rich history. This used to be the most expensive seashell in the world. Um, they're not, they're, you can pick them up for under $100 usually now, um, for mediocre specimens at least. Um, but they used to be really, really rare and valuable. Um, people, people actually lost their lives, like, you know, adventurers trying to find uh, specimens of this because they could be rich if they found one. I think it's kind of kind of cool history. The last shell I'm going to show you here uh, before I go, just because it's it's not a very good specimen, but I like it because it's huge. Uh, this is uh, actually f another one from Florida, in the West Indies. Uh, this is the second largest shelled snail gastropod in the world. It's called the horse conch, Pleuroplaca gigantea. Um, they rarely get this big anymore. Um, these these are um, part of the harvest of conch. It's not a tr they're not a true conch, but they were what, what people harvest as conch. And so, um, you know, they, they've been hunted out to, not to extinction, but they're, they're, they're hard to obtain in certain places, and they rarely get this big. This is an old dead specimen, beach specimen, but uh, it's just huge. Uh, the largest species in the world of snail is the, uh, uh, what is it called, the um, syrinx australensis. Uh, I can't, I don't remember the common name on it, but it's a, it, it gets like over two feet long. Um, it's pretty cool. Actually, almost three feet long. So anyway, I'm going to finish this. Uh, this is just light again. I wanted to just show some of the seashells and talk about some of their stories. I'll uh, talk to you later.